It was uh, first designed in 1932. And before they could finish this aircraft, uh, they went out of business. In 1935, the company was started to be resurrected with the idea of building this aircraft. Originally came out with a 85 horse Leblond. And in 1937, the man that was spearheading the company passed away. And that was the end of the airplane's life until 1968. It was purchased by another gentleman. And then in 1994, that gentleman got it flying with the helps of Tim Talon. Then for about six years, it flew around the West Coast. And I had about 65 hours on it. And then it was donated to a museum, the Hoosier Air Museum in Auburn, Indiana. In May of 2020, I purchased it from the museum. Worked on it quite a bit. It's been sitting for 20 years. Had the usual, um, the usual maintenance issues for that long and got it flying about um, a month ago. We've put about 14 hours on it and it's just a fabulous little biplane. It's a great little airplane. It's very small. It's got a 30 foot top wing. The bottom wing is 20 feet. This airplane was never certified. It doesn't have a Group 2 approval. And it does not have a standard airworthiness certificate. It was, um, it's always been experimental from 1935 to now. Now it's experimental exhibition use, similar to Warbirds or what have you. When it was sold in 1968, the gentleman that sold it uh, the new owner found a 125 horse Warner and he put that engine on it and that's a 422 cubic inch engine so we're you're upping the power considerably. When I purchased it I had the idea is there's a company that I'm involved with called um, Aeromotive Components. They were working on a new piston for 145 Warners. I took that engine off and I put this 145 Warner on and since it's an experimental airplane we were able to work really good with the Chicago uh, feds and the Minneapolis feds to to use this en this airplane and engine as our test bed for our new engine parts we're building for 145 Warners and we're in the process of getting these new pistons um, certified. So it flies quite sprightly. It's a nice flying airplane. It actually might be too much power. Um, elevator, rudder, those control surfaces are nice. The ailerons get a little heavy because you're flying about 20 to 25 miles an hour above what the normal cruise speed would be. The uniqueness of the Speedbird in particular is the side-by-side -side seating and most biplanes are, are tandem. Without any intercom system, you're a little bit, uh, you're very distant from your passenger or the other person you're flying with. And this one is so um, intimate, you can pull the power back and talk. That makes it unique and really neat. Always, I always had a fetish with uh, vintage airplanes. I've always liked flivver planes. I, um, I built a Heath Paris Hall and then a Curtis Wright Jr. And in recent years, I've gotten a little bit more into biplanes and this sort of makes both those worlds. A friend says when you're flying in formation with this, it's sort of like a little hummingbird, just sort of zipping all around. 
I, I, I am really attracted to the, the simpler, the better. Um, I'm, I'm at an airport that it's a, it's a private public use grass strip. There's, you're not encumbered by a, a lot of uh, radio work. You're back to the extreme grassroots of vintage. I attribute the, the airplanes, the airframes are so simple. They're almost like um, a 1910 wagon. Someone's pulling behind their horse. And then you add the engine to it and the technology. You have these two different worlds that come together and you create this amazing machine with just cloth, fabric, and wood.